sunrise, the colors of the morning are inside your eyes. The world awakens in the light of the day. I look up to the sky and say, Again, becoming a person with solid values really does start with knowing Jesus and letting him reveal how valuable you are and how valuable others are. 
Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 7. When Jesus noticed that all who had come to the dinner were trying to sit in the seats of honor near the head of the table, he gave them this advice. When you are invited to a wedding feast, don't sit in the seat of honor. What if someone who is more distinguished than you has also been invited? The host will come and say, you know, give this person your seat and then you will be embarrassed and you'll have to take whatever seat is left at the foot of the table. Instead, take the lowest place at the foot of the table. Then when your host sees you, he'll come and say, friend, we have a better place for you. Then you'll be honored in front of all the other guests. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. We remember that um, back in the Old Testament, humble thyself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Verse 12, then he turned to his host. When you put on a luncheon or a banquet, he says, don't invite your friends, brothers, relatives, and rich uh, neighbors, for they will invite you back and that will be your only reward. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. It's kind of interesting here because he names four people in that first group or four sets of people in that first group. And now in this um, kind of a, a literary tone, he's again using four different kinds of people. So he says, instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. So if you haven't seen it glaring already, we've been talking about kingdom values. When Jesus came, when the God man came to earth here, he brought with him how to live these kingdom values. And we as his people, people that have a relationship through Jesus Christ, we actually are supposed to be living kingdom values here on earth in a, in a kingdom that rather goes with uh, human values and human culture. And we're often pushed toward and pulled, dragged into things where when it comes to the kingdom of God, it's like an upside down kingdom. And he wants us to live by his values and not necessarily the values that the world tells us to be conformed by. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see, there's this background to this. And uh, if we look at it, in, in fact, I skipped a, a couple uh, verses at the beginning of this chapter because it talks again to the Pharisees. And even if you go back to, the, to the, um, uh, the previous chapter, it actually talks to the Pharisees and the leaders of the law, people that are in love with legalism, people that are in love with rules, people that think that they can somehow get to God, they can somehow get to heaven, they can somehow be rescued or saved by their own self-righteousness by their actions that make them look good, they think that God smiles upon them. Isaiah tells us our righteousness is like filthy rags. The only righteousness that counts is the righteousness that somehow we get through a relationship with Jesus Christ. So here we have, um, in these chapters, Jesus is scolding the uh, Pharisees and these lovers of legalism in chapter 13. And he's saying too that the time is coming. You guys need to shape up now. Instead of just constantly polishing your laws and legalism, there comes a time where you're going to be called to accountability and you think that somehow you'll have the best seat even in heaven. But you got to realize that you're barking up the wrong tree. We're talking kingdom values. We're not talking legalism. We are talking a relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ and sensitivity to the Holy Spirit of God in our lives. This is really important for us. And then he goes on to talk a little bit about how they love to work it out in the first part of chapter 14. He talks about the Sabbath once again and how they like to count their steps and have this law that makes sure that nothing of work that smells like work happens on the Sabbath or for us on Sunday because we're keeping the letter of the law. And he's saying once again to them, you guys, the Sabbath was made for people, not people for the Sabbath. 
So that's kind of the background here. So Jesus has been messing with people with their cultural views because he was, he is the kingdom here on earth. So if you can think back to the situation, so often how they would sit, they'd almost be in a U situation. They'd either be sitting or lying down, whatever it is, but the host that uh, actually called the banquet or the party, he would be kind of sitting at the base of the U, and then the, the honored guests would sit beside him, and so he could see everybody that came. And from our story, we have a story and a parable here, and from our story, we see that it would not make much sense at all for me to walk into this uh, party or banquet that I've been invited to and me to saunter on, uh, saunter on up to the most privileged seat right beside the host, sit down and take my spot. And then all of a sudden, somebody more important comes in and finally the host would say, hey, Steve, yeah, Steve. Actually, this is for Josiah. You're gonna have to go sit over there closer to the door. That would be absolutely embarrassing and humiliating. And today's text, we are actually contrasting the difference between humility and being humiliated. Humility and humiliated. That would be humiliating. And Jesus says, how much better would it be if I actually sat closest to the door, like furthest away from the host, and then the host sees me and says, whoa, hey, Steve, what are you doing way over there? Come on up here. I want you to sit right beside you. That would feel pretty good. But I'm not seeking that position that's actually been offered to me. Just like what's happening here is this relationship is offered to us. It's a grace given by God through Jesus Christ. And it's not something that we can grab and make our own through our own self-righteousness or the acts that we do. It's really, really important that even the values that we're looking at today, the virtues that we're talking about, they actually come when we know Jesus Christ and we get our value from Jesus Christ and we start to value others because how Jesus values others. That's really important in our time together today. Here in history, they had this U shape of this banquet. And you guys, there was no charity cases. I would not waste my time as a prominent guy back here by inviting anybody that I did not want to be. Everybody at my party would be a somebody. Everybody at my party would be a who's who. You would come and go, are you kidding, Steve's? an acquaintance with that guy, this is fantastic. Or I'd invite people that could help me with my career, or I'd invite people that could invite me back to another who's who kind of gathering. I don't waste my invitations on people that can't repay me or pay me back or invite me back. There's got to be some kind of payback here. And Jesus kind of nails it pretty hard. He says, well, if that's the way you work, then your reward is just there that day. But he's trying to help us think more eternally that the things we do today through kingdom principles, virtues, and values actually have a payoff out in eternity. That we can do some stuff now behind the scenes that people might not even know about. But Jesus is smiling and somehow there's going to be a reward if not only here, then in heaven with him. So again, it's a kingdom principle that's hard sometimes to shove into our minds and into our way of life. So this, this, this Pharisee had invited the who's who to this dinner party. And then Jesus takes this as a teaching opportunity. We see that he has taken this time in, in chapter 13 and the beginning of chapter 14 that he has scolded the Pharisees and the lovers of the law because, again, he's stressing that people are more important than laws, regulations, and rules. We are created in the image of God. Jesus loves people. Jesus loves you. He loves you. And Jesus comes to this banquet and all he sees is guys kind of elbowing their way to the place of prominence, elbowing their way to get to the front so they can sit in the place of honor. 
it's important that before we actually adapt these uh, kingdom principles or values that come from this passage, it's so terribly important to remember, my friends, that these just aren't pick and choose little values or I want to become more patient, so boom. I want to become more humble, so boom. You guys, all of these things that I'm talking about today, they're actually outcomes. They're actually outcomes that come from a collision course of being in relationship with Jesus. I want you to hear that again, that all of these virtues, all of these values, even fruit of the spirit, they're not just pick and choose kind of things. They actually come as an outcome of our relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So we start there, a collision course with Jesus Christ. Matt Mar- Markins, uh, he's actually um, an Awana guy. He says, again, we may be tempted to do a Bible light curriculum or a moralistic therapeutic deism with values and virtues, which are lovely, which are good, he says, but these are the fruit and not the root of the tree. The gospel is the root, the main story, Jesus He is our only redeemer. He is restoring us and we bring pieces of this restoration into the world. You guys, I hope you heard that. He simply said here that all of these lovely things, these fruits that we see of values, of virtues, those are fruits, but they're not the root. The root is in the gospel of Jesus Christ and we can only find freedom or a couple of weeks back we saw we can only be released from bondage through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And the beautiful part is it doesn't stop there, but we bring pieces of this beautiful, restoration we bring pieces of that with us as we walk about in our culture and in our world oh i love this here he's nailing us right off the bat in the chapter uh, 14 verse 7 he's he's talking about or he's contrasting almost uh, humility and humiliation it's humiliating to sit in this seat a uh, prominent seat and to publicly be asked to move when somebody more important shows up he's talking about. Jesus said it's much better to sit someplace in a more humble location and then have the host move you to a place of honor. I figure that's a pretty good definition or a pretty good contrast for us to know the difference between humility and humiliation. It would be wonderful to be able to keep a kind of a bird's eye view on this passage, but I think that would do us all a disservice. We live in a culture that values and honors assertiveness. Now, assertiveness isn't always that bad, but we value and honor it. So to actually have meekness, we think meekness equals weakness. We train our kids that they can become anybody or they can become anything as long as they keep their minds at work and they can become anything or anybody at any cost. That doesn't sound too much like humility. We love to compare ourselves by other people. We love to just to make sure that we're a little bit better than our neighbor or, 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 or that we get the promotion and not somebody else. We love to sit at the seat of honor at the seat of honor. Yet Jesus seems to elevate the action of service, serving our neighbor, serving those who can't give back to you, inviting those that does not benefit your resume or your reputation. And Jesus seems to elevate the action of service to combat against the value of of pride in our society. And we have this kingdom characteristic of humility when we serve our king and when we serve our brothers and sisters. One commentator says, pride notoriously is the great cloud which blots out the sun of God's generosity. If I reckon that I deserve to be favored by God, 
Not only do I declare that I don't need his grace and his mercy and his love, but I, but I also imply that those who don't deserve it shouldn't have it. Sometimes we think we're comparing ourselves to God's standards and yet we have a poor view of God or we've created God in our image. You guys, even this last weekend, I had, a fan, I had a number of fantastic conversations where people were talking about other religions and other thoughts and other values and all that stuff. And it really came down to this. I just said, yet many of those have some good values. Many of those have some, some uh, interesting teachings. But yet none of them have a savior that died on the cross for them and rose again. And now we all know that we sin and we fall short. And the wages of sin is death. But the gift of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. But then again, there's this art of... Uh, there's this art of false humility. You know the one I'm talking about. Like if you'd come up to me and say, oh, Steve, I mean, you are looking fabulous today. And I said, no, 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 please, no. I, I, no, I, I, I don't receive that. You know what I'm talking about. And sometimes we can put on an act of humility in order to be recognized for our humility, therefore honored for being humble, which is a total backfire. It's a total backfire. One author calls it a gimmick in order to be recognized publicly for our humility. He sees the thoughts and the motives of our heart, he says in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. So when they're trying to uh, anoint a new king, Samuel looks around and he doesn't get it. And finally, God has to say to him, you know what? You guys, you look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. So yes, God does see our service. God does see our action, but he sees the very heart intent of what motivates that action. So both are very important in the kingdom of God, but it's really important that our service, that our love for others, that our actions come from a heart of identifying with Jesus Christ and what he has done for us on the cross. Wearsby said, humility is a fundamental grace. And I like grace because grace really means it's a God-empowered action or it's a God-empowered transaction or a, a transformational action in the Christian life. And yet it's elusive because the moment that you think you actually have humility, you've lost it. I remember somebody saying a little quip many years ago, they're saying that somebody was awarded a pin for being humble, but as soon as he started wearing it publicly, they had to take it away. Boom, it's elusive. It is simply not thinking of ourselves at all here. Jesus is the greatest example of humility, and he would do well to ask, um, and we would do well to ask the Holy Spirit to enable us to imitate him. Now, I'm not talking about self-care. I'm not talking about all that. But I think if we're really honest in our day and age, we are always hearing and using these statements of, well, good for you. You deserve that holiday. Good for you. Go on that vacation. And we use stuff like that. And it's just like, did you know that most of the world does not get a holiday? Most of the world doesn't even get a weekend. So sometimes I like to push back on some of that language and realize sometimes of some of the, the, um, uh, the things that we get aren't necessarily a position of deserving them, but count your blessings when you do have some of this stuff. We may ask ourselves the question, what does this look like? What does it look like, this difference between humiliation or humility? We already know that from our story, that he's kind of parsed out that, you know what? You got to take inventory. You got to look at your own heart. You got to look at your motivation and your intention. 
because right there at the very seat of who you are, there's a good chance that if you're actually in a sober relationship with Jesus Christ, you can figure out that you're struggling with uh, humility or being, uh, or this whole thing of humiliation, but he wants you to humble yourself in his sight, having a sober view of yourself. Now, Wearsby, I think it's important here, he also doesn't say from our, from our passage here today, he's not saying that I prohibit you from uh, getting together with friends and entertaining family and all that. But what he's actually warning us about is entertaining only family and only friends exclusively and habitually. He's giving us this, ad- this admonition, that kind of fellowship, quote unquote, and here we're starting to meddle even with some of our small groups, my friends. Some of us never want to branch out, never want to invite anybody new to our small groups, and we call that fellowship. I think this portion of scripture is reminding us that if you're only inviting the exact same people and you've been meeting together for years and it's just a good old boys club or, you know, or a good old couples club, Are we not missing the point sometimes of our walk in discipleship? Uh, Wearsby continues to point out that this kind of fellowship, quote unquote, quickly degenerates into a mutual admiration society. I like that, but boy, is it meddling. So we only invite people to our houses or we you know, extend the, the, the hospitality gift. But really, when you look at it, sometimes we're only extending it to people that we know will stroke our egos or we, or we invite people who will invite us back. And here he's saying, in which each one tries to outdo the other and no one dares to break the cycle. And sad to say, too much church social life fits this description of the mutual admiration society. Our motive, he says, for sharing must be the praise of God and not the applause of our buddies. The eternal reward in heaven and not the temporary recognition on earth. Our modern world is really competitive and it's easy for people, it's easy for God's people to become more concerned about profit and loss than it is about sacrifice and service, he goes on. We ask ourselves the question, what am I gonna get from this? When I invite them over or when I'm kind to them, what do I get? And the Lord's gotta take out his chisel and chip away some of that pride, some of that ego to bring us to a place of humility. I like what Bach says very simply. He says, honor is not to be seized, it is awarded. Honor is not to be seized, it's awarded. He goes on to say that those who are humble recognize their need for God and not any right to blessing. I know that I'm messing with you guys right now because this flies in the face of even a lot of the teachings that we hear out there, even in churches. But here, I'm gonna say it again, that those who are humble recognize their need to be rescued. They recognize their need for God and not any right for blessing. This passage is not just about inviting your friends over for a party. Rather, meals were the arena in which social status uh, was established and maintained. People of that day would not think of inviting the lower members of society to their banquets since these people could give nothing in return. So Jesus is calling believers to offer the same kind of undeserved and unconditional grace that God has given us. That's a beautiful quote from R.T. France. Jesus is calling believers to offer the same kind of undeserved and unconditional grace that God has given us. You guys, this is incredible. When we realize this, when we realize what we have received, this incredible gift from Jesus Christ, and we turn in faith to him, now one of the actions that we're called to do is start looking out for others, and they may not deserve it. They may get on your nerves. They'll never be able to repay you. They'll never be able to invite you back to their home. But bless them the way that God has blessed you because you can't repay what he's done for you. So here's a commercial break for small groups and for microgroups. 
They need to be a place of encouragement, of growth, discipleship, accountability, and a a place for care and a place for mission. What I just said a few moments ago is sometimes we've made our small groups all about us and our comfort. And hey, we need great relationships within the church. We need great fellowship within the church. But sometimes at all costs, it's about me and where I feel comfortable. And as soon as we bring in another person or as soon as we bring in another person that uh, isn't our style as a group, it kind of breaks down the dynamics. You guys, maybe we need to expand our vision for small groups. Maybe we need to expand our vision for microgroups and for discipleship. I'm part of a microgroup, and the guys that I'm with, it's been fantastic. First of all, in a microgroup, it's a smaller group of people, so it's easier to schedule stuff. It's easier to move things around. It's easier to meet together. And even now, with this whole physical distancing thing, it's way easier to find a patio where you can social distance or physical distance and still have a beautiful time of fellowship and discipleship together. Some of the things that happen at microgroup is it's a time for transformation. It's a time for accountability. It's a time for action and service because in these stimulating relationships, you can kind of think, how can we get involved or what's something that we can do for next week? Or is there somebody in need or who can we pray for? And fourthly, there's connection. And uh, with connection, what I mean by that is there's fellowship with each other and there's also worship. We're connecting with God and we're connecting with each other. And finally, there's a call in microgroups and in a good small group to obedience. What are you reading in the word? What's it saying about God? What's it saying about people? What's something that's nailing me today? And who can I share that with this week? Who can I share that with this week? You guys, that takes a spirit or a virtue of humility. So let me end with this. It seems that our scripture is really telling us to do these three things today. Have a sober look in the mirror and spend time with the Trinity to understand your identity in Christ and that it's a foundational to all these other virtues and values. Secondly is we've got to humble ourselves and look out for others. We've got to humble ourselves and even start looking out for others that maybe nobody else is looking out for. And thirdly, we got to serve other people with a keen outlook for those who cannot stroke our ego or those who cannot pay us back. God wants to continue to reach people with this beautiful message, the gospel that Jesus Christ died for our sins and he wants us to live our potential. And you know what? He wants to use you to be an advertisement. He wants to use you in service of other people to help point them toward this relationship that's available with Jesus Christ. You guys, becoming a person with solid values really does start with knowing Jesus and letting him reveal how valuable you are and how valuable others are. May God bless you this week as you look in the mirror, as you continue to let him pour into you your identity and your value, and as you start looking out for others that can't repay you, but people that need a kind touch from a person who has been touched by Jesus. God bless you. Are you hurting and broken within you? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? for a drink from the well Jesus is calling Oh come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was born
death could not hold you the veil tore before you you silenced the boast of sin and grave the heavens are roaring the praise of your glory for you are raised to life again death could not hold you the veil tore before you you silenced the bows of sin and grave the heavens are roaring praise of your glory for you are raised to for another week of home church be sure to go to wrcconline.com to stay connected and also be sure to keep in contact with one another god bless you